Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm as hungry as you are, so we have 10 points that I just wanted to basically put on the floor uh, for what I hope will be something worth thinking about and discussing not only here, uh, but moving forward. And uh, these 10 things, I think, define the intersection between what the public expects and wants to achieve in terms of social group, uh, social good, what government wants and uh, hopes to achieve in terms of social go uh, good, and what other organized people, I mean, there are a lot of other people, you know, there's groups of citizens, there's civil society, there are political parties, there are revolutionary movements. Everyone is online and everyone wants to push essentially one thing, which is a point of view, and it is out of the combination of these things that things happen or do not. So the first I want to put forward is technology isn't everything. Uh, this is essentially a question that will come up over and over and again and again whenever we try to achieve anything online. What about those who aren't online? What about those who don't have the means to go online? What about those who are being affected by events so that they don't have time uh, to go online. Uh, and also, what about those of us who are doing something online? How effective is it really? It will affect the netirati. It will affect the media who are online. But even the media who are not online may take offense at this. Um, and so this is a discussion that will happen over and over again. The question really is that all our technologies, including online technologies, are only part of a larger whole. It has a role to play, and as everyone uh, seems to belong to the consensus that it will increasingly take a bigger and bigger role until it, it has the paramount role, but we are not there yet. And therefore, all our engagements must be viewed in the prism, from through the prism of it being part of a larger chain of communications, of engagements, of publics and organizations. The next is something very basic. John Lanier wrote about this when he called it the new digital Maoism. And just as the Maoists are online, I mean, you have, uh, don't know, you have committed people like Tonio and, and uh, I don't know, um, Mon Palatino and uh, Calori Conde, you know, whether you notice their presence online or not, there is an engagement. And if there are those who are pushing a radical notion of things, there are those pushing the other side, and there will be an inevitable clash. There will be an inevitable contention of views. And it can lead people either to make the internet a very unpleasant place or to tune out and disengage. And this is something that has to be uh, drummed into everyone because while we have many success stories where people can cross uh, lines, so to speak, where people can engage, uh, forgetting w their backgrounds and where their views are, there are many more cases where it has led to, let's say, bullying and unfairness and other people of goodwill disengaging because it's become too toxic. And you have to look into how um, this will happen and how this can spill over into those who are viewing all this activity from the outside. Your engagement online is not just being discussed online, it is being discussed in the traditional media, it is being discussed in the most old-fashioned form of human communication, which is our talking to each other in the sideline, having a smoke, having a meal. And all of these are coloring how people are going to uh, approach what they are doing online and whether they think it is a force for good or bad. Now, you can also um, move on if the signal is, if I move my hand, yes. Okay, um, the next point, oops. Okay, next please. Okay, next. Okay. What is important though, and I think this is a lesson, is that for any good to be achieved, it has to go beyond the power of one to influence many. And here dissemination is the key. It is the challenge in, perhaps, because um, 
particularly in stressful, risky, or emergency situations. The question then becomes, how do you get the relevant information, the relevant uh, knowledge out to as many people as quickly as possible in a way that people can trust and make important decisions around? Um, and here, of course, is where, again, your social media is only a portion of the overall public engagement. A spokesperson will say something, and it can be reported in many ways. It can be written as a report. It can be sent as a tweet. It can be written as a blog. It can be mentioned to someone over the phone. Infinite number of ways, each of which has its own repercussions. A report can be factual or not. It can quote you properly as, or not, just as much as a tweet can or cannot, just as much as a blog entry can or cannot, just as much as a photograph can be a fair representation or not, depending on the angle. So the question then is multiplicity in dissemination, that even if one channel may get warped or misrepresented along the way, if you pursue all channels, chances are the correct and right information will get out sooner or later. The ability of people to garble things is reduced. Your ability to cross-check as a discerning citizen is increased. Um, and ideally, the ability to uh, sift what may have been translated or lost in translation can be reduced. And again, here, reiteration is necessary. You may mishear it the first time. You may not quite get it the second time. Hear it the third, fourth, and fifth time, you'll probably get it. If you hear that there is a kind of color-coded system for warning about rain, you may take a while before you internalize it. So it must be reiterated, and again, it must be done over and over and again, again as quickly as possible with as little room for misinterpretation as possible. Um, and again, this comes by following many ways. You can know it when it happens by tweeting. You can go back to it and review it when you're a little less stressed or when you have a little lull time. It's collated in a Storyfy. Um, you can watch something where if it was an announcement, you can go back because you didn't quite get it at the time or you only heard it through the prism of a reporter and watch it on YouTube. And again, the other thing is context. It is, if it is important, as we were all discussing, to have the information out, that information is often of less use as it is deprived of context. Again, why will you issue a warning, or why is it important to get a warning out? Because there is a situation that is happening, and you must understand how that situation is developing. There are times also, and again, primarily in the context of an emergency, but not all the time, even in the context of an issue, uh, a discussion, a debate, where um, it can degenerate and become completely unproductive unless the context is supplied, unless you and everyone engaged in the discussion is armed with the same tools to help understand what it is you're talking about and why it's important. And um, again, here, it's, uh, this was a good example where the context had to be provided. You had to be told, what are these warning levels? Where are they going? What do these different levels mean? How were they arrived at? What can you do? The, the context becomes really urgent because um, otherwise you may be lulled into viewing it as an academic exercise or not one particularly relevant to you. And next, compilation is valuable. And again, here. The fast-moving nature of social engagement, of the social networks, often means that there is less time for introspection, there is less time for digestion, and even less time for building comprehension. So compilation is necessary because you may be caught up in the fast-moving pace of events, but there are times where you have to take a deep breath, step back, look at it. And if you do not provide the tools for people to do that, it leads to very, uh, that's where panic comes from, that's where misunderstanding begins. And again, 
it's also a way to document what we were doing because if you go on to the next um, slide um, and move on, you're familiar with these examples because these have all been lessons. Coordination will eventually be required. And what is a basic necessity for any sort of coordination is what you call a briefing. What can I do? How will I do it? Who do I talk to? When? What are we aiming to achieve? Your coordination will be far less productive if you do not have something to refer to and go back to because that other person who is engaged in trying to get something done doesn't have all the time in the world to be briefing you every time you have a little question. That's why there are FAQs. And in many ways, your, comp your compilation of information will help your coordination and bring everyone back to the focus uh, task at hand. Um, and so you have questions where you can do it before, during, and after an event uh, with people who have already started doing it well, so you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You just need to get more people on board to get things spinning faster. Um, and again, do you have concrete success stories of how this is done? Um, you have ways where it's, it's done um, in a way that will lead to a permanent change that will solve a real problem for people, such as... Now, this is important. Feedback is positive because um, one sort of uh, congenital weakness we have is our inability to do post-mortems, where everyone sort of lets out a big cheer when the successful event is done. We've addressed the emergency at hand. But we are only beginning to learn now, I think, to sit down, process what happened, work out where it could have done, been done better, where it totally failed, and then try to improve it for the future. Um, and this is where feedback happens. And it's really, I think we don't like it as a people because it leads to very personal things and people have a sense of ownership over what they've done and it becomes a big ego bruising activity. But it's a very necessary one. And I think one sort of, uh, we're getting more accustomed to doing. And I think that's where uh, young people are a lot better at it than, than our elders. Um, next. Um, sorry, I have, the guy was reminding me I'm out of time, so I'm just going to fast forward through many of these examples. Postmortems really save lives. Um, they're, they're one of the big sort of dirty secrets of, of the Hagabat period was we really don't know what happened to a lot of the cries for help. And that's because however much we were able to cob together, cobble together a response, it, a lot of people slipped through the cracks. And whereas it required joining together a lot of old style networking with modern technologies, you get the cries for help online, but you have to call up someone in NDRMC who radios someone in the Philippine army, who coordinates with someone else. And either they were chasing a wild goose chase because that person was okay two hours ago, which means the other person may never be attended to because you only have X number of trucks, X number of divisions on the grounds, X number of calls to make, X number. You see how it happens. So um, it can save lives, and it has saved lives. I can point to maybe 15, 16, 17 cases where the online engagement specifically left, led to a rescue that may not have happened at all. But could it and shouldn't it result in hundreds? That's how far we are from achieving something. And finally, on a final note here, let's all remember, when you are dealing with institutions, um, there's one fundamental problem you're encountering. The weakness of government, this is a weakness in engaging with people online. Government, for lack of a better world, word, thinks wholesale, while every cry for help online is a retail emergency. This is your problem. Therefore, that is where the frustration, the hostility, even the frantic cries for help comes from. Because all of us demand, rightfully so, that my emergency is the only emergency that matters. That is a human thing. Government, with all its creaky sort of 19th century institutions, are used to dealing with... Um, Wholesale emergencies, 10,000 people stranded here, 100,000 needing something there, millions of pesos required when all you're worried about is, I don't have load to call home, can someone help me get in touch? 
And that bridge between literally the 19th century institutions we have and the 21st century behaviors that are influencing your expectations of your government is something that we have only begun uh, to work out. And this is where you have to realize that for many of the people involved, not me or Abby Valte, who you talk to and know, and if you don't like what I'm doing, you can give me a dirty look and, you know, Behind us are people who, will, who were there long before we arrived on the scene and will be there long after we, le we leave the scene. And if we cannot convince and find ways to get them engaged on a changing system that is actually making many of their notions about life obsolete. For example, many of you are in the tech fields, which is against the whole notion of the bureaucrat who wants a job for life. And that's a whole different debate I'm not going to get into. Um, then we would have achieved nothing. We will have a stopgap stop gap, uh, solution to an emergency, but not a lasting change in behavior and attitudes that leads to a productive uh, change. So um, if any of these points to your mind should be discussed or you would like to discuss further, please contact us. You can, you know, Call me names on the official gazette, or you can send us emails, or tweet me, or uh, contact us through many other ways. And that's it. I exceeded my time.